Are you guys excited about just being here? But it's a conversation. Come and say conversation. Amen? Okay, will you please help me welcome our esteemed panel. These are friends. These are, these are a band of brothers, I call them. So please, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome from London, England, Pastor Lincoln Cassidie. He's actually an apostle in London. He's got an apostolic office over England, and uh, he's a man of God and a dear friend. I'm just honored that he's here, you know. So thank you, Pastor Lincoln, for coming. Our host, ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Mose. Amen. And a new friend, he's a visionary, he thinks two steps ahead. Welcome, Pastor Alex. <laughs> and then, of course, a dear friend also. Um, you guys know him, Apostle Grace. Come here, sir. These guys are a fraternity of brothers. Fraternity of brothers. We are not afraid to ask hard questions, questions that don't yet have answers. We're also not afraid to say, I don't know. How many know that that's really liberating? Or we're happy to say, in my estimation, this is what I see. Before we start, I want us to have just a three minutes, an optic like summation of how each of these guys viewed discipleship. So, Pastor Alex, how do you define discipleship? <laughs> Actually, discipleship has been a fascination of mine since I started uh, entering into church planting. Um, examining Matthew 28, one of the things that first struck me is seeing that when you read the original language yeah. of Matthew 28, yeah. the word mech mm. isn't there. Mm. And you realize discipleship is actually the main verb of that scripture. And so the rest of the other instructions, uh -huh. go, baptize, teach, yeah. are participles that are supporting discipling. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we had been taught from the start, at least from where I come from and things I've grown up with, discipleship was a class. You attended a discipleship class. Yeah. You did a discipleship program. And then I realized that what Jesus is talking about here is the process. Yeah. And so to Jesus, discipleship is not something you do as in make, as in we have a finished product called disciple. Mm. It is a process we are engaged with for life. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. Um, it's a journey. And then the other thing is you cannot talk about a disciple without talking about a master, a teacher, yeah. someone we are learning from. And so when Paul comes and talks in Ephesians 4, he says, you have not so learned Christ. Mm. And so it's a process where we are learning and continuously being turned into the very image of him that we are looking at who has become us so we can become him. Love it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Pastor Moses, define discipleship. <laughs> well, let me remember. I think it's Dallas Willard who said, a disciple is who Jesus would be if he were you. Oh, come on. A disciple is who Jesus would be if he were you, living in your house, working your job, uh, married to your spouse. That's what a disciple is. And I think it's Mike Brin who says discipleship is really growing the process in the character and competences of Christ. Not just his character, but his competences. Yes, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, and his character. Love, loving your enemies, and all of that. 
So I then look at discipleship as the multiplication of the character and competences of Christ among people. Wow, that's brilliant. Brilliant, thank you. Dr. Lincoln. Yeah, let me just talk about four Ds that I learned not long ago. Um, decision, deliverance, discipleship, dominion. Mm. The original idea when God was making man is to let them have dominion. So, discipleship for us starts with a decision for Christ and then hopefully going through deliverance processes and then stepping into discipleship and then back to dominion. The problem is if you leave it at decision, uh -huh. you've got the fan. Yeah. You've got to go to deliverance where stuff that doesn't belong is cast out. Mm. But my concern as a, the pastor is the church is obsessed with deliverance. Mm. And we've turned our pastors and our churches and our services into deliverance centers instead of discipleship making centers. Mm. And so people are finding out who bewitched them, what demons are in them. <laughs> the generational curses, we become students of darkness instead of uh, agents of light. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we have to change the conversation because usually when you can't find the light switch, you end up studying the darkness. So, <laughs> I really believe the conversation in Uganda has got to change. Yes, come on. And the problem is, if we really delete the obsession with deliverance, some churches may need to shut down. Mm. Because all we understand are demons who sent them, and what their names are, and how to cast them out. It becomes an obsession <laughs> which destroys those four. The process is we are here to rule and reign with Christ. Yeah. That was the original plan. Let them have dominion. Instead we are saying let them have deliverance. Yeah, oh and the missing link is discipleship. Wow. Amen. Powerful. Powerful. Apostle Grace, Devo. Thank you. Thank you. Everything that has been spoken is true. What probably I might add is the component of identity. Because we cannot discuss discipleship and ignore identity. Mm. I think it's the core component of the Christian identity. What does it mean to be born again? Right. I think for me discipleship is my identification. Because if I can't talk about identity, I can't talk about inheritance. Inheritance, yeah. Yes, because whose son are you to inherit what you inherit? Whose daughter are you to inherit what you have to inherit? Right. So the spaces of maturity here then become impartational, mm -hmm. not social commentary. Right. So people just don't come because the pastor is funny. You understand? But they come because they are receiving a definitive impartation. That's right. If our identity is not defined, then we start to find identity in the gifts that yeah. work in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. So I am uh, a prophet. But what am I before I'm a prophet? That's right. That's you right. understand? Because if I don't have that, yeah. then prophecy will make me, not Christ. Yeah. And so the marks of ministry have become the marks of our identity. Mm. And because of that then, our identity is getting so hidden into umbrellas. Come on. Come organizations. On. Come on. Apollos and Paul. Who do I yes. follow? Yes. Not Christ, the center. Yes. So for me, it's what defines my legitimacy or illegitimacy and the shame thereof if I'm illegitimate. Mm. If I don't have that conversation, then we're not even talking about discipleship. Wow. 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 Can you guys sit with those thoughts? Thank you, guys. Lisa, it's all yours. Amen. That's really good, um, Pastor. Thank you so much. Okay. First question. I love this one. Why is our generation today so resistant when it comes to believing the Word of God, but yet Christ's Word is so clear in Matthew 28, go ye and make disciples of all nations. Why is our generation so resistant to the Word of God? I think my first 
thought on that goes to Colossians chapter 2, I think verse 8, where men have been taught so many things, but have not been taught Christ. Mm. Mm. We've been taught philosophies. Yes. We've been taught traditions of men. Mm-hmm. We've been taught the philosophy of life. That's a really good life. scripture. There it is. Guys, yeah. read it. It's really cool. But not Christ. Yeah, man. Yeah. And so I'm afraid. Mm. Mm. People are afraid to even talk about Christ. Yeah. But how can you know him and be afraid to speak about him? Mm-hmm. But we have people who are sitting in church, but have not really been exposed to Christ. Mm-hmm. We have all these nice talks, nice psychology, mm. uh, nice business tactics, nice ways of relating with other people, but we've not been taught Christ. Yeah. Wow. And so when it comes to the task of now you go, it's like, okay, I go do what? Mm. But, yeah. yeah. Wow. Do what? That's great. Powerful. Yeah, very powerful. Anything else? I personally say this generation is no harder Ooh, than the Bible good. generation. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Jesus yeah. said the harvest is ripe. When the axe is blunt, <laughs> you blame the tree. <laughs> but the tree hasn't changed. It is us who have failed to articulate the gospel in the right language for our Amen. generation. That's so when the axe is blunt, you blame the tree. Blame the tree. Yeah. Take away. That's really good. So let's stay within this theme then, and this, this is great, gentlemen. Um, okay, so how do we practically then go back to the truth? How do we practically go back to making it about Jesus in making disciples? Practically. From a practical perspective? <laughs> practical perspective. Yes. We start. Mm. Yeah. We start. Yeah. I know. We start. We start. That's good. Yeah. The people who work and lead within Worship Harvest understand that the primary responsibility of a pastor in Worship Harvest is to make disciples. It's not even to preach. Ooh. Be a bad preacher if you have to. Come on. But not a bad disciple. <laughs> oh, oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. So, the thing is, we like to talk about it instead of doing it. So, we can spend the whole morning here, and if I find you in the parking lot and ask, who are you, discipling, mm. and you can't name them, because Jesus named them, he named them apostles and he knew their name, yes. then this whole thing is a waste of time. The answer is, who are you, discipling? If you can't name them, you're walking in disobedience. So just go and start. Just go and start, but that is kind of hard, though, right, if you don't have that training and if you don't have someone, I guess, who's kind of pushing you there. So find that mentor, huh? Find the mentor that's going to help you in that. I feel that one of the problems is structure. Churches currently are structured platform first. Everybody sits there to watch the superstars. The answer is structure, turning the church the other way around. So that church is garage, and then the real business begins after the stage. Yeah? Church must be handed back to the believer. Yeah? The role of the pastor is to equip the saints, the pastor, the prophet, the evangelist, to equip you for the work of the ministry. We need to stop the show. It lasts for only a few moments, and then the real life begins Monday to Sunday. That's where you make disciples. But it begins by a structural change, church into garage servicing, so that the believer is equipped to go into missional communities, finding a relevant expression in your local area. How am I banding up with my brothers and sisters and touching our neighborhoods? That's what church looks like. And that's practical. Love it. Yes, that's really good. That's really good. Okay, this is actually for Apostle Grace. Um, How do I be that minister that actually worships God in truth and in spirit? Mm. Okay, very deep question. Yeah. Because they that worship are in spirit and in truth. Everything we represent is spirit and truth. truth. Let me go back to identity. Because 
when we are talking about generational blessing, when you look at Abraham mm -hmm. was a worshiper. Yeah. Isaac was a worshiper. Mm -hmm. Jacob was a worshiper. It was a pattern mm -hmm. of one man reproducing after his own kind. Yep. Everything reproduces after its own kind. The reason why we see what we see is a product of who produced what. This is not just shortcut. You understand what I'm saying? There's no shortcut. That's right. Everything we see is as a result of what produced what. We must understand that. And I'll give an example. Now we are struggling to even define the ministry. Who is a pastor? I know. Because it's convoluted. Yeah. Who is an apostle? Who is a prophet? Because now today you are speaking to us and somebody just discovered this morning the difference between prophet and fortune telling. Mm. Somebody just discovered what? <laughs> right. Today. Right. That they have been under a fortune, a fortune teller, teller. Not <laughs> a prophetic voice. No. <laughs> so, that is truth. And I don't think we can define truth without biblical pattern. If you have a prodigal giving birth to sons, what do you produce? There's no identity. Now, there are things that are not in his nature. It's, they're not mm. in his way and pattern of doing things. You can't even tell them this is wrong because they don't understand what you mean by wrong. Many things seem wow. right to certain individuals. Mm. If there are people you can't even correct anymore because the heart is so dead. That's right. It's so dead That's right. that you can't give it life anymore. And so sometimes I even go back to thinking, maybe, just maybe, we need to go back and define salvation. Uh -huh. What does it mean to be saved? Because if a man is a new creation in Christ, Come on. Yep. and all things are of God, yes. then there has to be a result of that spirit of worship Absolutely. and, and Amen. prayer. I think Amen. for me that sums it up. Yeah, that's great. That's really good. Thank you. And the other part of this is how do you um, to shed some more light on being authentic in ministry? Yeah. Let me touch on that issue yeah. of authenticity. When you read the Bible, and I'm going to go back to what Dr. Dennis spoke about in personalizing Jesus. Okay? Sometimes it's okay if this personalization is to self-destruction. Mm. But what happens when this personalization touches assignment? What happens when this personalization touches accountability? Right. What happens when this assignment touches mandate and lives and testaments in the blood, the price? What happens? Because I told people, I said, when you look at the Bible, the fivefold ministry, when the Bible says you gave some to be apostles and prophets, pastors and evangelists and teachers, right, for the perfection of the saints, for the edification of the body, for the work of ministry. When you read the and there, and, mm -hmm. the Greek word there is ek, right? Mm -hmm. That means and. Mm -hmm. Apostles and prophets, prophets. and uh -huh. evangelists and pastors. Uh -huh. But when he gets to teacher, he doesn't use the word ek. Mm -hmm. No, he uses the word that directly means indeed, who are indeed. In, so it's not even the fivefold ministry. Right. It should sound as he gave some to be apostles, and prophets, and evangelists, and pastors, who are indeed teachers. Right. Who are indeed teachers. That means even the prophet should be able to teach. Come on. Even the pastor should be able to teach. Yeah. The apostle should be able to teach. That then brings the question of, in this personalization, I need to be held accountable. And if we're talking about accountability here, we are tested. You cannot talk about accountability without testation. That's right. And wherever there is testation, there is offense. Yes. There is inconvenience. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. understand what I'm yeah. saying? Jacob served Laban. God was teaching him something because he was going to father the love Christ. We cannot define authenticity in yeah. any realm of the spirit when we are not accountable. Oh. Yeah. Accountability. Yeah. Accountability. Okay. I want to add something to that. You know, blind spots. If you have an issue, your blind spots are inconspicuous to the one who has them. You don't know your problem. You can't see your problem. 
That's why you need a man who loves you and you say, hey, am I okay? How many have ever been to somebody has a big piece of spinach right here? And they're like, <laughs> and you're like, um, <laughs> some of us are like that. You're out there, you're like, spinach, the whole people are seeing like, uh, because the guy is surrounded by, you're amazing, you're wonderful, you, you, there's no accountability. There's no accountability when you're surrounded by yes people. There's got to be, find a man, a woman, somebody who says, who you say, if you ever hear me making it about me, please tell me. Because sometimes as you go higher, the oxygen is thinner. Have you ever heard of expert climbers who fall off cliffs? because they got disoriented. Everybody's like, how could he do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His breathing, he lost orientation. And sometimes I see my father's men whom I admire, we see on TV, and you're like, isn't there anybody to tell him that you can't do that? You can't do that. You can't fly to a strange city with your secretary and go to on a shopping spree and do, you can't do that. But there's nobody, because everybody's like, yes, yes, man, I've got, yes, man, I've got, yes, it's all personal. And they tell you, no, it's personal. That man is blind, and his blind spots are glaring to everybody, but he does not have, that's why we are forming a fraternity of brothers who say, you know what, we're going to serve Jesus, not an umbrella, but fraternity is, hey, Grace. I love it when Grace said that sometimes when he's hit, you know, Moses will take him out and they will just drink juice. <laughs> Not like, e -kakati, you know, I read this in the news, you know. He, you're going to say it, you're going to tell him. You're going to say, because he said that Moses doesn't even ask, hey, okay, they are saying this about you. Is it true? He just says, drink juice and they are quiet. <laughs> and he leaves comforted. My friend was with me not to quiz me but to be with me. In fact, I usually define a friend as somebody with whom you can endure the awkwardness of silence. Can I just be with you and we don't talk? <laughs> That's really good. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I have a couple of questions that are kind of around the same, so I'm just going to ask them in just a couple different ways and whoever would like. Explain more about yielding to the Spirit, is one. And I would like, or shed some more light on, as a minister, receiving from God. So, receiving from God, yielding to the Spirit, completely letting go. There's another one of just really completely letting go of everything that I'm holding on to, so God can minister and God can show me. I think at the heart of the miracle of creation is this thing called free will. God created man sovereign. That is a dangerous statement, but I'll say it again. <laughs> God created us sovereign. We have a will. Angels were given a will. Man is created with a will. Otherwise, without it, we cannot worship. Yep. Worship is a voluntary act yep. by a sovereign being to exalt another. Yeah? Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so man has to be sovereign. God cannot gate crash. God cannot bulldoze himself into your life. And I know there are uh, Christian traditions who teach that man is really a puppet in God's hand, a pawn on God's chessboard. He moves you as he wishes. Now God created man with such sovereignty. And our capacity to worship comes out of that capacity to choose not to worship. And what makes worship very precious, it is a voluntary act which God cannot command out of you. He mm. cannot simply make you worship. In fact, I recently was arguing that God does not choose the worship songs on Sunday. <laughs> That's true. Because otherwise he's worshiping himself. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> it is a sovereign act of the human will. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> to step into supernatural inspiration and download songs which are fully God and fully man. In terms of if it wasn't you, they wouldn't have shown up, and if it wasn't God, you wouldn't have found them. But the trigger is your will, your decision, your choice. That's good, that's good. 
And so when we talk about surrender and um, yielding, it's the realization that although God is omnipotent, omniscient, he cannot crash into your life and do as he will. He wants you to collaboratively surrender your will to his will, to submit your will to his will that his will may be done through you as a voluntary act of worship. Yeah. And so all our deeds are acts of worship because we are yielding our will and submitting to God. And that is expressly presented to us through, for us as the gospel presented, God who has a will presenting to us his will and asking us to submit ours to his Amen. through a voluntary act initially by saying I receive Christ as Lord and then living and walking with him daily by taking up our cross to die to our will daily in preference to his will. I think I would even push a little further uh, into what uh, Pastor Lincoln is saying because I, I think our will arises from our very likeness that is after God and the essence of God is love and if he's going to create us in his image and in his likeness we have to be created with capacity to love but the capacity to love has of necessity to come with also the capacity to reject love otherwise then it's not love and so my will comes out of my nature as a lover but also one who has the ability to receive and reject love because if you will make me love you without the ability for me not to love you yeah, that's right. then that ain't love anymore yeah. and so man is in the likeness of God and so I and the truth is when I love I worship I've always told people I love my wife so I talk about my wife uh, conversations that have nothing to do with her end up with her in there because mm -hmm. of love and that the origin of worship therefore comes out of my will because I am a lover at the essence but this loving the love is also originating in God because God is love and so if man is going to become a living soul God has to breathe into man and the breath of God the spirit of God is the spirit of love and so when we talk about yielding I want to understand it that for me to become alive to God he has to pour his spirit in my spirit so that then my spirit comes back to life to God but my other faculties are catching up with the process but to understand that within me is already the existence of the spirit of God yeah I will either give myself over to the flesh or I'll give myself over to the spirit and the Holy Spirit is already at work in my spirit and all I need to do is recognize that and the more I recognize so the process of yielding is really the process of awakening that which is already in me yeah. and responding to the reality of the Holy Spirit inside my soul. Beautiful. Good. My spirit, yeah, that's beautiful. really good. Beautiful. <laughs> that's yeah. really good. It goes with the next question, really, and I think you just yielding, I think, is exactly what you're saying, Pastor Alex. Um, okay, so then how do we develop or grow that relationship with the Holy Spirit to be constantly in communion despite our busy schedule, despite the work, despite our family, despite our, our children, how do we do that? How do we just grow that relationship? Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to go back to the conversation he has opened up on the issue of will. Yeah. We must first separate that when we say will, we're talking about will, plural. The will of the spirit and the will of the flesh. Those two things are different. The soul is in the middle. And the soul has a will too. We must understand that. Right. The soul can choose to go to the side of the flesh or the side of the spirit. That conversation also has to be brought to the table because when the Bible says, for example, that the spirit is willing, what does it mean? It means that the spirit man is new, is willing to pray, is willing to fast, is willing to sacrifice, is willing to give, is willing to do all these. He's yeah, willing. Right. And 
But then my soulish realm also has its wheels, and they are thought-driven, they are emotional-driven, they are feeling-given. You still have someone who just doesn't feel like worshipping. They just don't feel it. And you know what? Even if you don't feel it, Jesus is what? Absolutely. I'm absolutely. So what you is what? Me, I'm against still on this personalization because you start me. Yeah, so, <laughs> one to this, one to this, the soul can shift on any side, depending on what is available for us. If we yield to the word, the soul inclines to the spirit. If we yield to carnality, the soul inclines to the flesh. And that is why we bring the conversation of death, because then if we're discussing death, how can there be will in a dead vessel? But I believe that this willingness in the dead vessel is the handing over of one lesser, inferior will to a higher will. Mm -hmm. And that is why Christians undergo a certain consecration, which really seeks to kill the flesh. Paul says, I beat my flesh to subjection. Yeah, come on. Least after I preach this gospel, I myself will not be disqualified. Yeah. So he's not actually his flesh. Yeah. He is in there. Yeah. And I think the only way we can reconcile this is firstly understand what are the things in me that are alive in the flesh? Okay. What are the things in yeah, me that are so, so easily good. opened yeah. up to life? Right. Because that flesh touches the world of tents and opens me to the most That's right. you know, funny thoughts and feelings That's and right. emotions and reactions. Yeah. And so if I can help uh, in killing my flesh, mm -hmm. that is why we fast. Mm -hmm. yes. Christians don't fast. They fist the whole year and think that their body will just continue taking that in and not have a compromise. No. We, we fast. Not to move God, but to help ourselves. God has already moved. Please, please say that. Please mm. say that again. We think we can engineer God uh -huh. or we get his attention by... And the, manufacture shortcuts. Yeah. We think it's a formula of a certain equation, E equal MC squared. You understand? <laughs> so that's relativity. It's not truth. Come it's on. It's theory. You understand? <laughs> it's theory. I, I yeah. think we have to go back to the things that I think this dot-com church is losing. Come on. Our fathers prayed. Come on. Come on. Our fathers yeah. fasted. Come on. What were they doing? They were beating the flesh to subjection. Yeah. yeah. The spirit is already wheeling. And I think mm -hmm. we need to have that conversation. Have that conversation. Our people used to set themselves apart. And, but what if I can't? Vamos, Sergio. Yeah. yeah. You, you have your Sergio. What's Sergio? Yeah. Yeah. Chico. Yes. For being spoiled. Yeah, for being spoiled. Okay. Yeah, spoiled brat. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be a spoiled brat. Yeah. 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 It's like when we preach grace. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people think that grace means just being there, passively waiting for everything to happen. <laughs> because you're under grace. You understand what I'm saying? I, I know. They I know. don't know that the grace of God is not supposed to be received or taken in vain. Yeah. Paul said, I labored more than all my brethren, yet yeah. not I, but the grace of God. Grace is the embodiment of labor. It's the work that pushes you. Yeah. You cannot say that you're a child of grace yeah. and, and you don't have the strength to no. do some of no. these things, and we are not talking about the message of grace. That's really good, because it's a pervasive misconception um, concerning the grace. I mean, I don't know why we even... The overemphasis of some of these these issues also create dysfunctions for us. You know, we just now it's deliverance. Everybody has to throw up. Have you been to those churches? Have you been to those churches? Oh man, this church is where we go and there's buckets everywhere. When you get saved, have you gone through deliverance? You need to go and vomit. You need to vomit. Be free. If you don't vomit, you're not free. How many know sometimes deliverance? People vomit. How many know that? But does it have to be everybody? All 7,000 people? Go through vomit. We went to this one church. It was actually in Asia. All the pastors had little bags. Buvera, you know? Yeah, all of them. Because the minute somebody goes... All the pastors... They were right there with specially made vomit bags. And I'm like, ay, ay, ay. Why do we go crazy like that? Maybe some of the guys could address this. Most people, when you're saved, when you have that encounter with Jesus, Jesus delivers you. 
Amen. You delivered. Most of us are delivered upon encounter. A power encounter of Jesus sets you free. And here, you know what else it does? It also breaks ancestral stuff. You don't have to be going. My sister calls me. She says, Dennis, I have to go to deliverance. I'm like, what? Because they're ancestral things. I'm like, please, those things are gone. We have been saved a long time, but because she had come around, a man of God, and you know, Africans, we love our leaders, don't we? And you trust the men of God that they, because you're busy working. They are reading the Bible every day. They're supposed to be experts. So when you come and the man goes, you know what? The Lord is telling me, everybody, we need to break this thing. You need to break. You need to go back. Now in America, there's a big thing called with deliverance. If you're a woman, you have to remember every man you slept with, and you have to name them, and you have to break every hold. Soul ties. Guys, please, let's drop the gimmicks. Let's drop the gimmicks. And somebody but also that. as we bring a little balance for people to understand that. Because yes. you're going to say that and they'll find you casting out the devil. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And you say, Dennis, why are you casting? There are people who don't understand why we do what we do. Yeah. If a man is a new creation, old things are passed away. Yeah. Old things are new. And they are of God. Mm. But not everybody understands it. That's right. If you see someone is ignorant, cast it out. Because that's what they want. Right. Are you hearing me? <laughs> then after casting out, teach them the truth. Yeah. Because you might lose them in their ignorance. Yeah. People can strangle them and they die while they're still understanding the message. <laughs> you understand? So if you find that casting out, don't think we don't know new creation realities. But I would rather not lose this fellow. That's right. So I'll cast it out, roll him down vomit his things then after I teach him the gospel because we might lose <laughs> yeah, that's right. a man that's right. in the process when he's still trying to understand the message. Yeah. <laughs> I got saved 1981. No one has ever cast a demon out of me. But I will tell you my body was cut in witchcraft shrines. Uh -huh. Stuff was rubbed in. I entered more witchcraft shrines than some of you will ever do. We had all kinds of gods around our house. When I met Jesus, the depth of that encounter was sufficient. Come on. Huh? Really Amen. good, Pastor. Yeah. To deliver me from the root yeah. with no manifestation. Yeah. <laughs> Please understand. Yeah. Do not feel you have to ride, vomit, kick, scream for you to experience deliverance. Come on. Neither should you think somebody has to minister deliverance to you. You can encounter God in your own heart, in your own passion Please. and encounter, and be permanently delivered for life. For life. <laughs> Without remembering who bewitched your grandmother and who will bewitch your grandfather. Yeah? So it. please understand there are many now who are studying darkness because some believers are committed to darkness. Pastors are now becoming graduates in darkness because people are stuck <laughs> in darkness. <laughs> yeah? And so we have now lists of demons and we know them by name. And if you are a Musoga, you must know Busoga demons. If you are a Muganda, you must know Buganda demons. And now you must have a bucket here and a list here. And then we go through <laughs> seven oh weeks God. of deliverance. But please understand, things you do not receive by revelation will always be temporary. Oh, so, most deliverances do not last because they were approached from the lower realms of deliverance, where you are depending on study. Whereas we have been saved by grace through faith, not by our own work, not even study should set you free from demons. You should be able to download from God. Until you download it by grace through faith, it is still spirituality. And spirituality does not last, but the kingdom of God is forever. That was really good. <laughs> I love it. Caution, caution. But with the, the inner healing stuff, you can really become emotionally traumatized by 
the man of God taking you through all these processes. I've had people who have been introduced, who have developed phobias, developed hyper vigilance, demonic hyper vigilance. There's a demon everywhere. Do you feel them? Do you feel them? It's like, I'm like, what happened to you? Yeah, I've been going to this church. You know, a friend of ours was, was, was going to Oman and just been actually demonic, the whole teaching of deliverance. And everywhere she was casting demons out because there's Buddhist shrines everywhere. Finally, after a month, she's like, I'm going crazy. There's demons everywhere. I said, why don't you just go eat? Just go to a restaurant, just go eat, just order. You don't, you tell her what, when you go eat today, don't even pray. You're going to be okay. She's like, no, no, you have to. You have to. I have to anoint. And I, like every hotel room she went to, she would anoint everything. I'm like, okay, that's hyper vigilance. <laughs> when are you sleeping? No, they're in my room. I told her, they're everywhere. <laughs> they're everywhere. But we walk in dominion. Dominion. Amen. Amen. That's the key, isn't it, Dr. Yeah. Dennis? We walk in dominion, we have that authority. Yeah. But that's where that lie comes from, where yeah. there's little voices inside that are like, no, no, you don't have that. No, look at what you did yesterday. You don't have the right. You don't have that authority anymore. And that's the vicious cycle that so many. Okay, so this falls in line with exactly with what we're talking about right now. Um, so let's help this person. I got saved six years ago, and I was baptized this last October. I joined a cult church, and I was on the intercession team. So I realized that I was in the wrong church and left. Am I still born again? Or do I need to renew my life? Oh. I'm no longer experiencing like the gifts and the visions and this and that. Wow. Well, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The Come on. In the world. Yeah. Uh, don't worry whether you're still saved or not. If you gave your life to Christ and even have a consciousness of it, Come on. you still belong to Christ. And the word of God should be your standard for living. And it's good you discovered that wherever you were they were not really up to christ and his word and you've moved out of there just start you know reading his word praying talking to god and fellowshipping with believers the ones who are okay <laughs> the ones that are okay let's clarify yeah yeah and just you know just walk in that joy your father loves you come on yeah. uh, he loves you more than you love yourself so just be assured of that love it it's good. Okay, this one is a very busy person. So, how do I balance focusing on God and Jesus with all of the calls and challenges that I need to invite people to church so the numbers will grow? I have to give to the work of the ministry and all the other givings, in parentheses, that do not necessarily or directly minister to Jesus? How do we balance all of that together? Um, I think the Church of Jesus is awakening to the separation between eternal purpose, um, the system of biblical pattern versus the system of the world and Babylon. I think we also need to have a conversation around that mm. because even in scripture we have seen people regarded as busy bodies. Yeah. Busy bodies. Paul calls them busy bodies. And those can even either be outside the world or be in church. And what makes a busy body is a spirit that is not aligned to purpose. Yeah. Divine purpose. Because if you have divine purpose, then your days are appointed. You have understanding of why you do what you do when you do it right, and right. to whose glory you do it for. Yeah. Um, I have seen people that have been so held up in a Babylonian system that they are so busy for anything except God. Yeah. That they are on time for interviews but late for service because they are busy. They are on time for the movies. They are on time for flights. They are on time for everything in the world except God. And Satan has consumed them. Not that all work is evil, but I've seen people who are in the realm of work, but they're not even serving. There's no purpose in it. They're enslaved. And their bodies start to take the toll of the system they're under, and they live lives 
of service, but without rejuvenation of the spirit, and they grow old to treat diseases that they have accumulated because of the labors of enslavement that they've suffered all through their time. There's a man I know who treated ulcers until he died, but he got that because he was banking for 25 years. But by the time he died, he had sold everything treating ulcers. That's a Babylonian system. And so I tell Christians, when you become a new creation, one, deliberately pray that, yes, I'm working to the glory of God. I'm not saying don't be hard workers at your places of work because we all work to the glory of God. But never lose the sight of purpose. Yeah. Even when you get to a place where you're trying to say, how do I balance? The issue is not a balancing issue. The issue is a purpose issue because that's where the strength of God comes. If it comes, then I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I cannot find that strength when I've not found purpose. I tell that person, first find purpose. Why are you here? Thank you. Yeah, I actually also get concerned when someone is doing whatever they're doing, even if they're doing it for God more out of obligation than delight. And that means, uh, like Apostle is saying, that person is not aligned uh, both to purpose and really assignment. If you are not aligned, then what you are doing is you are serving out of dead work. And that is burdensome. But his yoke is light. And his burden is easy. And so I still would ask whoever asked that question or whoever had a similar question is go back and find why are you doing what you're doing. If it is to please your pastor, well, that's a cheap service. Uh, but if it is to the delight of the king, then it's a high calling. That's good. Thank you. And let's get some help. What's the busy body thing? It's really big yeah. because there is as much the man who works or doesn't show up and the man who over engages both don't produce much there's sometimes a satanic conspiracy in keeping you busy you're so busy that you you're too busy and sometimes for some of you actually making traction means resigning from certain things do you have to be doing all of those? And what he said, is this a Martha kind of thing where you feel you got to do stuff to gain validation? Are you okay with you? Or do you feel okay because you're doing stuff? And it's really, really important because, and I've seen ministers too, and at our level, sometimes you get to our level where the option isn't good or bad. It's good or God. Yeah. Good or God. Because everything is good. That's why we overdo stuff. That's why ministers go, you know, because every... Can you imagine turning down a counseling appointment? You know what the enemy tells you? What if they die? What if you have thousands of counseling appointments? But your wife needs you, though. She needs you at home. Now, you know, Pastor touched on something that's big. It is impossible to be balanced. In fact, I call it the meat of balance. You don't do balance, we do rhythm. Successful people are not high achieving people are not balanced. We overdo our passion. Jesus overdid his passion. Name them. Paul. Paul. You overdo it sometimes the case the way you die doing it. So we're not called. In fact, if you achieve balance, you'll attain mediocrity. We overdo. But what we do, we do rhythm. When I am with my wife, I am with her. When we're on the road, I'm on the road. I'm, you know, my kids, they know daddy will never be there throwing the ball every evening, doing catch, oh baby boy. No, they're not, they don't have that daddy. But this daddy, I know what my baby girl is doing because I do rhythm. I do rhythm. I do rhythm hard. We work hard, but we're not balanced. Balance is frustrating. We cannot be balanced. I think Africanize it. Some yes. people are still trying to understand what do you mean by reason. Yes, sir. Yes. You, you, you. you began the good work. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Interpret it for them. Interpret it for them. What do you understand? I, I think what it's saying in my Africanness, it's trying to say that 
When you're saying balance, where is the Holy Spirit? Where is Come the on. Holy Spirit? Okay? And what has the Word of God told us to be and do? What he's trying to say is, one, understand your priorities. Right. Okay? We must understand our priorities. Is God, my family, and the ministry? Mm -hmm. For me as a pastor, I know it's God, my family, and the ministry. Right. The ministry, yeah? But there are events sometimes the Spirit will lead us to attend to ministry, and That's my right. family must understand. Yes. Yes. However, I will have my days as well that I'm off. Yes. If I'm off, then I have to be off. Yes. If I am there for my child, then I have to really be there. Yeah. You understand? For me, yeah. I play basketball three times a week. Yeah. I don't cancel when I'm playing basketball. Yes. And when I'm playing it, I really play it. Yes. You, 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 you need to. like 10 p.m. until I pass out, I get home, I don't even know the way to the bathroom. But... <laughs> I love it. But I when I'm it. present to eat, yes. I am present to eat. Yeah. The only challenge sometimes is a place where you get home and you're still counseling up to midnight. Yeah. yeah. And your wife needs you. Yeah. And your children yeah. need you. Yeah. I think that's where the challenge is. Yeah. Recently he sent me a photo of his family and they were on the beach. He didn't look even born again. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! He was putting on a beach side. It's all open up to here. You could see the chest. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, his family will never think that our yeah. father was busy for the ministry because when he was there, yeah. Yeah. he was yeah. there. there. Yeah. I hope I've answered. Yes, sir. That's, the, that's the rhythm. Rhythm when a do, 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 do. When is it? If it's family, you know, I'm intense. We're intense. When we play, we play hard. When it's food, I enjoy my food. When it's sleep, I snore. I am intense. Intense all the way, but like what Pastor said though, you know, God, family, ministry, but if you look at Apostle's life, you will find that ministry proportionately takes a lot, but it doesn't mean that she is now, no, intensity, God, my family, my ministry. Amen? But you, when you're in it, you're in it. You're really intense. So stop stressing about giving eight hours eight here, here, eight hours here. here. Because if you actually attain that, you will only do so much. Amen? Wow. So good. That was like a whole other lesson all in itself, wasn't it? <laughs> Everyone's getting their notepads out. Okay. This question gets asked like almost every time that we meet. How do we differentiate between our voice and God's voice? Our voice and God's voice yes. is the Word of God. Yeah. It says it's a discerner and it's a divider of soul and spirit. Your voice is going to be in your soul. Uh, the Word of God, Jesus says, the words are to their spirit and they are life. You can be sure that only part of you that 100% corresponds to the Word of God is your spirit. So just check with the Word of God. Uh, if it, doesn't encourage bank robbery and even a prayer before the bank robbery, <laughs> then don't do it. <laughs> yeah, some people pray yeah. to be successful while robbing, yeah. apparently, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. It's almost like somebody asking you to describe how it feels when you are swimming. There's no words. You need to experience it to know it. But when you are in it, you know it. Come on. It's like that. But I think the amplification of God's voice grows as you read the scriptures. And allow that to go until tipping point. Our first hearing really must be beginning to hear the scriptures. Uh, because they are the word of God. Written objectively to you. And that exercise, the Bible says, talks about having your senses exercised. To discern good and evil. So the reading of scripture love exercises it. your spirit to hear the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. So read your scripture. Worship. Worship. Listen to the preaching of the word. When you come to church, don't come as a consumer. Come as an imitator. Come as a disciple. Yeah. I need to put this in. There are three ways that we learn. One is information. The other is imitation. And the third one is immersion. Yeah? Info, 
imitation, immersion. You must be immersive in your learning. Don't just listen to the scriptures or the sermon. Get inside it. Capture, be with your pastor. Why people scream amen in the sermon is not simply being a hearer. It's getting so connected with your pastor. Sometimes you even know where they are going and you get off your chair and you don't know why, but you know exactly where they are going. Ah. You become them. You almost are in tandem with them. So you've moved from information. You've gone into imitation. Yeah. You are receiving impartation. You are soul to soul. But then you go beyond that into immersion, yeah. becoming saturated with the thing and entering it and becoming so absorbed in it. These things all open your spirit man. Because you learn to connect with your worship service. Don't arrive late and interrupt other worshippers. Come early. Patch where you're patching. When the worship begins, connect not just with the song, but also the source of the song. You understand? It's becoming immersive as a believer. These it. things help your I spiritual sensitivity. It. Yeah. And so when God comes to speak to you, you are not just drawing from your anointing. You're also drawing from the anointings around yourself. But I'll give you three things that are taught as a standard for guidance. There's a harbor somewhere in the world which is surrounded with rocks. And the only way the ships are safe in approaching, you must steer. There are three lights that are on the harbor, but you must steer the ship until they become one. Do you understand? So if you see all three, you are approaching wrong. So you must steer until they become one, then you approach. So somebody told you, you need the word of God, that is lamp number one. Then the conviction of your spirit, yeah? The voice, what you say. If what you're hearing does not align with the scriptures, as Pastor was saying, delete. Now sometimes those two align, but there's still a lack of alignment on the third area, which is very practical. And it's called uh, the witness of events and circumstances and reality. I mean, the scripture said, be married, yes. You spotted somebody, and you feel the spirit is saying, but then you find out they are married. <laughs> You understand? So the practicality cancels out the other two. <laughs> so in the end, does it make sense in the land of the living, this thing that you're saying God is saying? Not to say that everything must make sense, but sometimes there is a test outside of mere scripture and revelation that brings a witness. So I'll give an example that Paul wanted to go uh, to certain areas of the world to preach. But the Bible says he was forbidden. He could not go. Inside he wanted to go. He knew the commission to go. But circumstances did not align for him to go. So it meant either he wait or that he is wrong. Or that, you know, understand. So sometimes right. you need to wait until things align before you approach. Otherwise you're going to hit rocks. That's really good. Yeah. yeah. Allow me to add something very yes. small. Yes. Now this again, I'm going to bring it in the African context. <laughs> you will understand my heart. Now. Africanization. Yes. When you are African, mm -hmm. or if you are Asian, the spirit realm is not a mystery even before you receive Christ. Right. It is a bitter mystery to the Western world. Yeah. Europe, no offense, the American. Right. The British, when you talk about the spirit realm, they don't understand it. But here men walk on water even when they are not Absolutely. Jesus. Uh, absolutely. In Africa, guys walked on water. He's a guy who a guy just sits on a skin and floats. You understand? So that's the world. And because Dr. Dennis used the word superstition. Right. If you're a reader of church history, 1926, East African Revival, Edward Joe Church, the Simeon Sirambis, the power that comes in that period, the anointing which was evident. And then a time comes of Odili Eboa, who yeah. many have questions yeah. because the demonstration of the spirit yeah. was intense, yeah. but without the words. Yep. And then the late 80s into the early 90s where everyone wanted to be a teacher because it was the gap in the church. Yeah. Are you hearing me? But we connected to the spiritual, mm -hmm. we connected to the demonstration of power, the spectacular. You understand? And anything that is demonstrative. Now when somebody comes to church, it's the first thing they meet. Come on. The word is secondary. Wow. You must understand That's this, Africa. The word is what? Secondary. 
Why is he a man of God? Because he cast out a devil. Not because he can interpret Romans. Why do you call him a prophet? Because he told me my date of birth. But can he explain Colossians chapter 3? <laughs> so, how then would God be so down to make me fail to understand the mystery of Christ, the unsearchable riches, and tell me a telephone number? <laughs> How can I be so articulate to get a telephone number, but I can't interpret the New Testament? Which is more important to God? To know the phone number? He said, who wills that all men be saved, and that they might come to the epignosis of God, not gnosko, not progressive knowledge, complete and perfect knowledge of God. That is our problem. So I think even in answering this question, Lisa, we must switch to raise ministries that are firstly word. For me, if you preach the word, even if you come flying, I will kneel down and say in part, you understand? But <laughs> if I see gaps in your understanding of the message, even if you call fire from heaven, I have issues. I think that's the church we need to raise. That's the church we need to raise. That's the church we need to raise. That's really good. Wow. Someone actually wrote in, why do Christians also have to follow the world system for financial success? Wow. I think, first of all, there might be assumptions made about what the world system, system is. is. That's great. That's right. That's right. Yes. So, for example, there are people who believe that work is as a result of mm -hmm. the fall, mm -hmm. and so it's part of the toil mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And they don't know that even before the fall, Adam and Eve had a garden to tend, <laughs> which yeah. they had to extend around the world. Yeah. So work is not of the devil. <laughs> In all labor there is profit. All godly characteristics in the book of Proverbs lead to wealth and all the sloppy stuff lead to poverty in the book of Proverbs, like being mean and uh, oh, sleeping a lot and being lazy and not delivering excellence leads to poverty. And whereas uh, being diligent, uh, being generous, Come on. walking in the blessing, it says it leads to wealth. So, for me, there's no question about that. That's not worldly. The other thing I've encountered, I'm just quickly cutting through because I did a whole series here. I wrote a book, people left the church, so I know this stuff. Oh <laughs> you went the whole cycle. <laughs> yeah, they would rather remain broke, but I'm like, no. So the other part is uh, some believers have a serious problem with saving. They think that saving means you're not trusting God for tomorrow for the future. Wow. But it says he shall bless your storehouses. Oh, wow. Oh. Now, back then, you had to have real silos or, what do you do, granaries, because it was grain. But now your grain comes in Uganda shilling. Oh. <laughs> Am I making sense? Yeah. Yes, you At are. the end of the month, they write you a check. It's not grain. That check is representative of grain. Of grain. And so, you need to have store houses. Because at the end of the day, you must become an investor, a person who is not depending on day-to-day -day work to survive, but rather you have your money working for you. This same wisdom is the wisdom Joseph used to save Egypt. And the whole world, and the Israel going to Egypt to survive because he said there will be seven years of plenty, which is your working life, where uh -huh. there's plenty and excess, and then there's seven years of scarcity. Your time, up, your full time preaching the gospel life, mm -hmm. where you're like, I'm no longer surviving on making money, I'm now going to let my money work for me, and I'm going to be a free person who follows Jesus. Uh, and those seven years of plenty is when you're not actively looking for money, but your money is working for you, and it's able to, you're able to fulfill your whole life's calling Come on. because your storehouses are producing the resources you need to live. So I attacked it that way because I think a lot of people in church 
are confused about what are world systems and yes. which ones are uh, godly systems. So here is how you know it's a worldly system, when you have to kill, maim, and climb over others to have it. That's not a blessing. That's not a blessing. I think God's right. dominant system is he gives us the wisdom, to the power to get wealth so that he may fulfill his uh, covenant which he swore to our fathers, which is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is in you all the nations shall be blessed. That's why he says the scripture for us in God would just fight the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel, the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, open quote, in you all the nations shall be blessed, close quotes, and then says, those who are of faith, including Moses and Mekisa, are blessed with believing Abraham. They are blessed the same way Abraham is blessed to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. You can't do that with the small monies we have gotten used to in church. Oh. Can I just add a verse here, Ecclesiastes 2.26. To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth ah. to hand it over to the one who pleases God. Ah, now, <laughs> that verse can go ten different ways. Uh, because then people say, okay, let us wait for the transfer. Uh, but I think, <laughs> I think Pastor Moses has explained. One ungodly way to work is when you work with no wisdom, knowledge, or joy. Yeah, that is an ungodly way to work. And like our pastor was explained to us, there's a difference working under the grace of God and the difference working under strife. Yeah? Mere labor and sweat is not the inheritance of the believer. Yeah. It is the Babylonian system. It is Cain versus Abel. Both yeah. of them build an altar. Both of them slay, bring an offering. Both yeah. of them strike a match. There's fire. But one fire is wrong, the other is right. Because one is grace-inspired, revelation-equipped, uh -huh. hmm? and on. it touches the heart of God. Both of them may sweat and go home after five o'clock, but one does not please God in his labor. It's the same choice you see through scripture. When God elects one and rejects another, God chooses David against Saul. He chooses Mary over Martha. We need to understand both of you can be working and one of you is under a different system, not because they are working a different job. Both of you are going to China to import stuff. But one has no sense of joy, no wisdom in God, no revelation. Both of you will import a car, you'll clear it at the port, and God is working with one, the other is surrendered to the market systems. So, there's a bit of wisdom in the question, not in saying Christians should work less, mm. but there has to be a spirit of revelation energizing and driving Christian labor. Because the labor, the commission of God on Adam, the word work, when the Bible says the laborers are few, that word laborers includes revelation and worship in it. Wow. So we need to find worship in our work. You need an encounter with God which translates your workplace into a place of worship. So that whether you are typing at a keyboard or carrying sacks of rice, there is something revelatory about your labor. Come on. And there's really a good. sense of God's grace working in whatever you're doing. Yeah, yeah. so good. So good. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Since we're talking about money and finances, uh, do churches tithe? to another body, where does the pastor tithe? I have been a strong believer mm -hmm. and I have strongly emphasized this everywhere I have gone, that this equation is not complete if as men of God we are not doing what we want people in the no. church to do. Yeah, exactly. It's not possible because we are trying to reap what we have not sown. Be not deceived. That's, really That's good. deception. Mm -hmm. And um, I tell all pastors and I say, look, the Bible speaks of the heathen mm -hmm. to the priest. Mm -hmm. 
But now you're talking of illegitimacy. We don't even believe in having men above us. Mm -hmm. right. So how can you even bring the conversation of giving up what when yeah. we don't have up what? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And if we do not have upward and we're not giving upward, how do we then expect to that same thing to work in our ministry? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a dangerous and selfish thing if men of God don't look back on this issue and reconsider. Mm -hmm. That's a genuine question and a hard one to answer because it's like service. Somebody asked me, how do you have people who will serve you, like in the crusade we had in Gulu, people were pinning up posters the whole night. And these are lawyers, these are engineers, these are doctors. How do you have such people serving you? I simply told him I served. But the kind of question he asked was like he was waiting for an E equal MC. <laughs> Go and pray this way, apply Malachi 3, then connect it to Genesis and Joel 2, sketch in two hours, the anointing will be released, and people will be like spells who are zombies. No. And I think for people to have understanding of this, you reap what you sow. A serving man will be served. And that's why I love what he said, the promotion, these high places we are seeking for. But now let me reiterate that it is here. Some people see this but they don't know that we have clean toilets. Right. We have washed cars. Yeah. Slashed compound. <laughs> At one time I was a grocery boy mm. for a man of God. Mm. And I was waiting there, whatever he needed to send me for. This dot com, yeah. you understand? Yeah, yeah. They think it's like the way you swipe your phone, that password, and it opens. Yeah. That's what they think the gospel yeah, is. We have to be realistic. Yes. It's not so. No. It's not so. People scream of limitex. But they don't know, if you hear the other side of the story, that these men would sing during the day and pray the whole night, every day. <laughs> every day. Yeah. They were not just going to eat pork and then sleeping and say, yeah, tomorrow we have another show. No. <laughs> and Limitex set a certain precedence, but people don't understand the altar. No. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? They just celebrate the fire. Oh, oh, because they don't understand. Oh, and yes, oh, where the, the work is. They appreciate the product yeah. and not the process. And so, yeah. even when we're talking about money and wealth and all of these things, it takes us back to the whole process. That Christians have to learn to do process. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they do. There is no get rich quick tomorrow. They tell you, miracle money. Who will say, stop that madness, Christian? Jesus did not send us into a field of miracle money. He didn't. No. Say it again. He said, you shall read what we So, Actually, yeah, you can add some. Yeah, so uh, really practically, I think what Apostle is saying, as a pastor, if you don't tithe, don't think your people are going to tithe. Uh, the scriptures say that a student is not better than their teacher. When they are well taught, they will be like your teacher. So you will produce who you are, not what you teach. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. And isn't our generation asking those questions right now, though, too, right? They're asking why. Then, like, the, I just asked you that question from a millennial. Why? Where is your tithe going? They want to know. But they need to see the example, exactly what yeah. you're saying. They the need voices to see. of Jacob, the fleshes of Esau. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, practically, for me, at least right now, I mean, uh, um, Dr. Dent, like you said, we are growing. Uh, even us here. Mm -hmm. But practically where I am right now, I do think that my wife and I are the first members of our church. And so we tithe to our church. As pastors, we do. Then as a church, uh, we do tithe to. And um, Hebrews, the writer says, uh, it goes without doubt that the lesser is blessed by the greater talking about Abraham giving tithe to Melchizedek. Um, and, and so I think there is validity to tithing to our spiritual fathers, but I also think there's also validity to tithing to ministries that you see are uh,
greater than where you are. And that the reality there, men and women. And, and can teach you. And can teach you. Because it can be great but not instructive. Exactly. So, that's where I am. And I want to just elevate the conversation even more. Um, these questions are really postmodern. We never fixated about, because if you love Jesus, I call them vital signs. If you love Jesus, you give. You give. When do you stop? Because you're a pastor, now you don't. In fact, shame on you, people are giving, and you're not. Shame on you to, can you imagine consuming everything you get? Because sometimes you, you look at the tithe, and, and it's arguable whether the law of the tithe is applicable to organizations because we could go deep in that, but for your church to receive so much money, take off a junk and say, God, come on, what do we give this? It is a joy. We are thrilled to give. And sometimes I add up, sometimes the attorney, attorney you know, we have a tax, he says, you're giving too much. You know, this is a, this is a huge, do you, know, you realize you give 40% of your revenue? Oh, I did, oh my God, that's a lot. But but because you don't think, so the idea of ten percent, ten parts out of the one, um, can we elevate to a different place? The Book of Acts, they were so consumed by this thing that they gave so much that no no one had a need among them. How about that? How about we give until? How about because we have a better covenant, right? Can we just elevate beyond? In fact. Committed Christians, I know it's been your experiences too, we give more than 10. Right? Don't we? Don't we? We give more than 10. So, can we, I think I want to tell you what we have done to get here, rather than throw the book at you. Because we can throw the book at you, the tithe. We give more than 10%. 20? Oh, here, better still, who's counting? Who's counting? Who's counting? We give, because you give, sometimes you're like, hey, okay, we need money for food, okay, money for, because you're, you're giving, you're a giving machine. You give, out of, your, out of your love for Jesus, you give, and for people. And so, instead of counting the numbers, I propose a Jesus culture. A Jesus culture that is like crazy givers. There's a church in uh, Singapore, they give so much, you know, they're at par with the Singaporean government. When there's issues, the church stands it. It's like, we can send three planes to Taiwan. The church, and the youngest, the oldest member is like 30. They're all young people. And by the way, Singapore doesn't have the tax exemption thing that you know you give for tax break. No, they're just amazing young people who just love Jesus. One of the vital signs that you love Jesus is you are a giver. This is really modern. I'm telling you, we've got some fathers here. This is really modern to have this fixation to teaching how to give. How about we teach people to just love Jesus? If you love Jesus, we won't need to gimmick you, coax you, threaten you, prophesy to you, manipulate. No. Can we just love Jesus? Because if we love Jesus, our buildings, are, you need to be thinking, this needs to bother you. Please don't make him come here and say, Kati Banange, please, you're giving your pledges. No, you're working and you're thinking, how much beyond what I eat can I give to mm, mm, that window? You know, just, it's beyond just the law of it. I don't want to throw the book at you. Let's transcend dogma. Let's transcend just the law of the tithe. I propose an engrafting to Jesus culture, as exemplified in the book of Acts, where we give until there's no need. Can we do that? Is that too radical? But you've got to pay your bills. Do you pay your bills? Do you know that some people that, 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 people that give, that actually I have had to call and say, oh, you're giving too much because your bills are not paid, your wife, look at your wife, you haven't bought her anything. But yet, every time there's an appeal, you say, uh-huh, do we do that? There's, every time there's an appeal, you're giving, you're giving. I'm like, because uh, you're like, brother, God bless you. This is what I make. 
Okay, is that what you make? Okay, you're giving, amen, the minister will receive the money, but your wife, your, your wife has the same shoes. It's Valentine's Day, can you take your wife? And sometimes we don't cash the check because I love them too much. I don't want to see them lose their homes because they're giving. Because that's dysfunction. That's fathering. I care for you, not the ministry. Again, it goes back to our priorities. If it's for me, it's Jesus, family, ministry, and somebody is over giving, it is a trap. There's a trap, a modern trap, which charlatans use. You can't out give good. You can't out give good. There is, but there's such a thing as over giving based on your income. Is that shocking? Please allow me to say something. I, I didn't plan to, yes. but, but this I felt should not go. Yes, sir. We have also had a situation where we are raised in ministries that are so need driven. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Yeah. And that is why when you tell someone you're over giving, it's strange. Yeah. It's almost like, Mushumba. Yeah. I thought as much as a man gives, so they what? Yeah. They receive. But I think our giving, because it's a worship and truth driven giving, right. it is spirit led, mm -hmm. not emotional. Yeah. And sometimes I see even people give out of emotion. Emotions, yeah. I've seen men manipulate everything out of people. One time there was someone who went and said, Those of you who have bank accounts, stand up. Yeah. They have bank accounts, stand up. They all stood up. He said, now, I'm not forcing you, but God has said, hey. okay, hey. that they should all empty their what? Their bank account yeah. and what? And bring the money to the man of God yeah. because the ministry has needs. We men of God have to understand, thank you for the word you shared, it is not our church. Yeah. On this rock, I will build. Yeah. When you understand that as a man of God, you'll never fundraise. You'll never manipulate a person because you need a ticket. When you know yeah. that this is not your oh, ministry, yeah. but the Lord's ministry. And okay. why do I emphasize that? Yes, sir. Someone came to me one day and they brought me a fast food. Yeah. Let's eat what it was about 10 million. And I asked them, who is your pastor? Yeah. And they tell me the pastor. Yeah. And I said, so if your pastor, the man who pastors you wow. is supposed to receive a fast fruit. Why are you bringing it to me? Whoa. Because you blessed me last week. I told him, no. Because I blessed you last week doesn't mean that I've been in your life. I didn't die wow. for you. I didn't shed wow. my blood wow. for you. Wow. Take it to your pastor. Wow. Why? Because I all got a certain accountability. Exactly. If exactly. that money yeah. crosses into my bag, money killed Ananias and Sapphira in a New Testament dispensation under bread. People understand this. Don't ever play with money. That thing can kill you. Wow. In the New Testament that is, that is so powerful. Wow. My mother, let me just be honest with you, my mother was going to some of the churches here and almost every week when I call, Mommy Oriotia, how are you doing? She says, Munangeha, you need to send me money. I'm like, what? Because I've been going to this church, the minute they know that your mama was saying, pay, what? The pastor stands me up. We need to buy the chica chimuchala sempe was stand up one hour, he will send you money. In Jesus' name, you're supposed to build that, okay? Okay, Mwandike. And so mommy would say, I can't go back there. She was going from church to church and has to be incognito. And that's why I get the passion from this, that Pastor Grace, that's life-giving for you to say, to hear a pastor here actually saying, I care for you, I, that this is out of order. This is out of order, you know? So, guys, okay, so. yeah, there are some deep things. Can I help some business people? Yeah. People get a loan from the bank uh, and tithe from it. Yeah. Wrong principle. Yeah. You tithe from your increase, not from the loan. <laughs> yeah? 
Yeah, from your debt. Yeah. From your debt. Yeah. <laughs> I also was talking to a young lady who all the takings of the week, including yeah. what should be removed as capital, she tithes from. All the takings of the week. You must run accounts, know what is capital, allocate things so that you are tithing from your increase. Yeah? Now, a lady got a settlement, a redundancy settlement. They paid everybody. Yeah. She took her entire settlement. Africanized. Uh, yeah. NSSF. You call it NSSF. Eh? <laughs> uh, somebody needs to help me. <laughs> me too. So she was given a large amount of money because her job ended. She ran with the whole amount to church and bought chairs for the church. Oh. Yeah? Then she started job hunting. She never got a job. This is weird. Her friends who bought settlements, bought houses, bought land, started businesses, and went on to prosper. She was running to church for dinner wow. every day. This is a pastor told me honestly. He said, Pastor, the sister blessed us. We bought all the chairs we needed, but now because she had no job, we had to feed her. Wow. And that woman continued to look for work, did not get work, and the church had to carry her with integrity and honesty. She never got a job. I believe she was a test to that church. <laughs> so I'm raising the point that Pastor Dennis was saying that sometimes you overgive, but sometimes somebody may have received the word to bring all they bring to the church. But that does not mean the church now walks away from them. You must commit to that person and make sure they are not left on the street. And that church served that woman, fed her, accommodated her, wow. found a house for her, yeah, moved her, she got sick, they hospitalized her, paid for all her bills until she went to be with the Lord. Wow. wow. So in the end, they may have given her back than what she brought. <laughs> that was a good story. But what she brought furnished the church in a moment which they needed. Then they committed to her long term. Wow. I believe it was a test from God. Wow. Really wow, wow, wow. Well, we're finished, <laughs> gentlemen. So, we All right. it up. <laughs> Can we have some final clothes? comments? Yeah, some final comment. Alex, wrap it up, sir. I think the big reason we have sat here is to explore the issue of discipleship yeah. for our day. Paul says, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And we build on no other foundation except Christ. I think uh, the biggest role we have as leaders today, and you mentioned it at the, at what, as, as you were ending, that for this generation, for this time, we are it. We're it, yeah. And we owe it to the master to equip the saints and equip them well. And there is no other thing we ought to teach or give people except Christ. If men and women will get land in Christ, I think we shall be okay. Amen. Amen. Moses. Again, leaning into discipleship, Second Timothy 2, to the things you heard from me among many witnesses. Commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The discipleship conversation must translate into action yeah. so that it stops being a conversation because I am convinced that anyone who is not discipling will, being faithful with what you know before you know the whole of Leviticus is walking in disobedience because discipleship is a command. Be faithful with what you know, not what you don't yet know. Wow, that's I am an outsider. I, um, I lead a church in London. I have been heartbroken over the state of the church here. I am excited that uh, there is a clear move of God to demarcate between mm. false teaching wow. and true teaching. I want to thank God for Dr. Dennis's ministry here. Yeah. For this leader's huddle. The fact that some of the most significant ministries in Kampala are located on this platform right now is not a joke. Yeah. I want to encourage us, friends, 
this is a movement. This is a movement. Yeah. It's a reformational movement. Yeah. Pastors, let us be courageous yeah. and do the right thing. Yeah. Let us take our nation back yeah. from false teaching. These days, being a Morocco has become a curse word. We need to change that. I actually wish we could invent another word and start like there was a reformation in the past. We need a Pentecostal reformation oh. where pastors stand out and say we will not sell out to the deception of our day. We are going to stand up and be counted and build churches that are Bible-centered. Wow. That's my question. Um, firstly, thank you, Dr. Dennis. Touching our end tonight, for me, our speech has not been representing the language of the Spirit. Mm. And if we have to touch the language of the Spirit, our generation has been communicating words that we have failed to form sentences of. Mm. We are a generation that has been walking in the shame of illegitimacy because we have not had many fathers. The instructors were many. And those that we gave our hearts to wounded and maimed us, the sword that was to cut asunder, separate bone and marrow, maimed us and incapacitated us. It broke off our legs and feet. And many young men and women are not even able to trust anymore. Mm. Even the order of 50. I've wow. met men who said, yeah, I don't believe in church. Wow. Don't tell me about pastors. But I love God. Wow. Because they were cut. And I tell people sometimes when you're cut for so long, you even bleed in front of people. You're not supposed to bleed too because, because you don't know that you're bleeding. When a you pastor is preaching, you don't know when they are bleeding. Sometimes some wounds are so open because they were so cut for a long time and the scars stayed. Sometimes you say, no, wow. let me just leave it open. Wow. Because even when I stitch, it will be cut again. You understand? Or if I leave the scar, the cutting will be deeper. So let me leave the wound open. And many pastors are ministering wow. from a wounded that's, that's right. perspective. Worshippers are worshipping in wounds. Ushers are ushering in wounds. Preachers are preaching in wounds. People are giving in wounds. And I think we have to define discipleship to the level where men can heal under this process. We have to forgive. Yeah. We have to forgive, Abuluganda. You have to let go. You have to yeah, believe and say, look, they did out of ignorance. But now the ultimate question is, the next generation is looking for mothers and fathers. Yeah. Abuluganda. The next generation is looking for voices separated out of noises. The next generation is looking for legitimacy. And they need to connect to beyond the man of God, to Christ. And I think this is the essence of these conversations. And I pray to God that such conversations continue coming through. Again, like you said, the men here don't claim that we have it all. Maybe we even erred in some of the answers That's we right. Get. That's right. Forgive us. Yeah. But judge the heart. Yeah. And know that we love the body of Christ. And that we love God. Yeah. And that we want to serve God as long as we live in the best ways that we know how. I was sharing with these men of God when we were taking tea back in the day that maybe we have met very many eunuchs. And now eunuchs can't father. And because a eunuch does not live for inheritance, if he would die, who will he leave it for? Yeah, yeah, so he will build everything for him. So when we went to serve men, then we were serving personal agendas, building the kingdoms of men and not the ministry of Christ because mm. they don't see anything beyond their generation. Yeah. Yeah. That's the eunuch spirit. Yeah. And it's not wrong to be a eunuch, but it's wrong to die a eunuch. Come on. You understand what I'm saying? On. Sometimes it's good in the separation when we are making, but then at one particular point, even the Baron Abraham became a father. Because at one particular point, I believe that every man here listening to us will father this generation and mother it to the glory of God. Oh. 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 Did you guys enjoy this? Was it life-giving? You know, like, oh, thank you for saying that. We do not claim to be answer men to stuff, but we just, that we're impassioned. We're impassioned. But may God help us. May God help us. I think we can create a shift. And I am ready. Amen. I am ready. So. 
Redebushta Bereba. Rebushta Bereba. A new reformation. Everybody say reformation. This is when guys decided, uh 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 uh. uh. Establishment, church, Roman Catholic Church. No, 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 no. We got to do better. I believe right now we got to do better. How many feel that? How many feel we got to do better? Men, women, bold, who say, you know what? The craziness stops with me. I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm going to love Him. Mr. Peter, come here. Brothers and sisters, I've been so moved by one of our Uganda who sat here and dissected the mind. The Kenyan church. I am indebted to Uganda because when the East African revival came from there, my grandfather was one of the first to receive in Kenya. And I am a product of that revival. Our story is incomplete without you. I'm saying this for a reason because Apostle Grace said something and he was, you know, and uh, Dr. Dennis asked me to say something. He started to jump on this. What is going to happen with the next generation? Uh, our fathers, what they call the boomers, gave us something. Generation X carried it, but now we're coming to Generation Y. Millennials and Generation Y are asking why. Why is it this way? My question to us, ladies and gentlemen, is what is the next generation going to inherit? Uh, two years ago, Dr. Dennis, I sat with uh, the head of the East African Institute and they began to tell me something. This is not a Christian organization, it's a secular organization. And they said this. They said, uh, they did a survey of East Africa. The median age of Kenya is about 19. Uganda, I think they said 16. 16 in Uganda. And they said that 73% of Kenya's population is under 35 over 76 percent in Uganda is under 30. But this is what they told me that was surprising, shocking. They said, even though the churches are full, in that millennial and post-millennial generation, only five to seven percent are now going to church. Only five to seven percent. I began to ask myself, what is wrong? Where are the people who look like Kenya, who look like the real Uganda. Us, you know, with the white beards and whatever you know, guys here, it's starting to show. You're in the church, but those who are coming after us have become jaded. They don't want to get involved because they have seen through our games. They've seen through our gimmicks. I want to point out something that's very important. I'm going somewhere with this. Most of us speak with a Ugandan accent because we live in an environment where Luganda is spoken. The environment we're exposing the next generation to is this brokenness. So they grow up thinking that the broken dysfunction is normal. We can't let that happen to the next generation. Not normal. Not normal. Apostle, what you said was true. I may have been broken, but let me draw a line in the sand and say enough. That the next generation will not grow up in dysfunction. I want to leave this challenge with us that we say, I may have been broken, but I'm going to get help. But this is where the line is drawn. The next generation, as far as I am concerned, is going to be different. This is what I would like us to do. Can I challenge us as the new fathers and mothers of East Africa? Because I dare say those who we call fathers were even younger than some of us on this platform when they began to change nations. Benson Idaho died before 60, yeah. 59. 
but he had shaken Africa. Can I ask us to take up that baton and say, we will be different? We will be different. Is there somebody here in this room who said, you know what, if it's up to me, so help me God, it will be different. I choose a different story. I choose a different ending to this story. I want to paint a different picture for my children, even those who are not yet alive. That my children and my children's children will see a different church, a different Thank Africa. You, they will see something that is profoundly different. Yeah. That when it is power, the power will be genuine. Because if the blood of Jesus is not enough, then it is not enough. This God is real. Amen. So can I challenge us with that today? Amen. Can I challenge us with that today? As we pray, I want us to say that I am going to be the one. Here I am, use me. Here I am, use me, I've opened, send me to the nation. Let me be the beginning of a great new reformation. Whatever the Lord is putting in your heart to do, to Amen. give yourself, to turn it around, to break off, to jump, to do something, whatever it is, allow the Lord to move in your life. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hands up before the Lord come on tonight as we, as we allow the Lord to ruminate right here. Come on, sing grace, come on.
God's going to cause a disruption. What's a disruption? Say, say this, disruption. Limit X, just so you know, we did what we did. There was always a spirit of disruption on us, which is looking at the status quo and doing different than the status quo to produce better and to just lift Jesus high. There is a status quo, as you have seen, we've talked dysfunctional pastors and leadership and a culture, let's call it dysfunctional culture. The Lord seeks to cause a disruption. He doesn't always lead, he doesn't need 500 people to do it. No. Come on. He doesn't need 500 people. How many know this is enough? This is enough to cause a ripple effect that will cause incredible disruption for the cause of Christ. We must take back Africa. We must take this back and do different. And I dare say, are you ready for this? God is too creative to have to borrow a page out of history to write our future. Fine! The dad did what they did. How many know we celebrate Papa? the guys who come on who braved who raised us we celebrate our fathers the ones who raised us but I'm gonna say this the Holy Ghost is not depressed he's not thinking oh man he's like but you know what he's looking for whom to use and I dare say friends some of these guys are gonna be shakers again again even when I say that, the definition of shake is big masses. Oh, no, 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 no. Shake it. Shake it. Shake it. Pastor Grace, I want to, I want Pastor Grace to pray for us and to just close here and I want us to catch what is here. Can we catch what is in the house? Yeah. It is more than just hearing. Can we catch this? This is to be caught. You catch it, you're different. You hear something you may forget the minute you look at your Facebook timeline and la 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 la. But if you catch something, it's going to stay. And so I want us to open our hearts and just receive the mandate of the Holy Ghost concerning the next chapter for the Church of Jesus here in, here in Uganda. There's nations represented, there's five nations, I think Denmark is here, Pastor from Denmark as well. There's a lot of nations, it's an international spot. But what God's doing here, there's a ripple effect from tonight. If we can catch this, so open our hearts. Sir. You'll allow me to kneel and pray. Please, yes sir. We can join you. Can we join him? If you feel that. Thank you, Jesus. Father, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis 12, you appeared to our father Abraham and told him, get thee out of your country, out of your kindred, out of your father's house, and go to a land I will show you. He did not doubt you. He did not doubt you. 
you separated the man from all familiarity and he did not doubt you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, we choose to step out of the familiar tonight. For what our eyes have seen, ears have heard and have entered the heart, those we step out of to enter things eye has not seen, ear has not heard and has not entered into the hearts of men. That faithful God told him, I will bless you. And I will make thee a blessing. You told him, I will make thee a great nation. He said, I will bless them that bless you and cut him that cutteth you. And the Bible says, and Abraham went without knowing. And the truth is, sometimes God, we go without knowing. While men are asking for things money can buy, we are asking for our generation. Yes, please, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because yes. if we are relevant now, yes. we'll have a story for the next generation. Yes, Jesus. We are asking, asking Jesus. for a voice yeah, yeah, yeah. as clear than it has ever been in the history of church. Yes. We are ready to let go of anything that we have learned if it does not add up to this. Yes, Father. And we are ready to go everywhere you send us yes, for the fulfillment of that purpose. Yes, Father. I feel that men and women in this room have awoken to the consciousness of divine purpose and what is at stake for this generation if we should lose it. Like our fathers knelt one day in this land and asked for revival in 1926 and brought a fire. Yeah. We are kneeling today, God, asking for something new in our generation. And as we believe it, God, we know that if our generation can get it right, the next generation will get it. We have been raised and tamed in the wombs of church, but we have not been fathered in ministry. And when we step on those altars, we walk on them and limp off because we don't know what to do. But even in the time when we don't have available men, still be our shepherd and teach us the things we must know. Because we cannot lose this generation. All we have is this one life. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And like the Bible says, you can walk through us now and give an answer to the generation coming yeah, yeah, yeah. is what we are asking for. Yes, Father, Father, yes. Tonight, God, we yes. are receiving more than gifts. We are receiving an impartation of responsibility. Yes, in Jesus' name. And I see that the stars are gathering under the oil yes, for this dispensation. I see the hand of Christ pouring out something so distinctive. And he says, I'm giving you a name. I'm giving you a mark. I'm opening your eyes to see things you have not seen. To hear things that you have not heard, to walk places, the bulwarks and the streets of Zion that many men have not treaded. I see angelics coming for this cause and inquiring in the things that you're showing us as a generation. I see you aligning us to purpose and course. And every man and woman in this room is saying this one thing God, we are ready. Yes, we are. We are ready. God, we're ready. We are ready. Yes, we're ready. We are ready, God. We are ready. We are ready, God. We are ready. We are ready, God. We are ready. We are prepared, God. I feel a song in my heart saying, Take my life and let it be
footprints, not out of ambition. Yeah, they were there. Yeah, they did more than just come to church. Yeah, they did more than build things. Yeah, they caused an impact. Flames of revival, fires just blowing over this land new generation. We have them. Thank you for giving us a generation. Thank you, Jesus. 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 We are ministers. Woo! Come on, let's rejoice. Come on, 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 come on,